no money is very bad as me. All right, so quick recap for isomers. Um, this is pulled out of our textbook from this year. Um, and this is one that I would not necessarily thought to put cis trans as diastereomers, but they technically are. Um, but yeah, so you got your con constitutional isomers like we discussed, and then we got stereoisomers. Um, and then enantiomers are stereoisomers where they're the non superimposable mirror image, right? And so the most common form of that is R and S enantiomers. In fact, I can't think of a case where uh, where a non superimposable mirror image that's not a, a asymmetric center like we've been discussing. So I'm pretty sure that that's enantiomers are sort of their own thing. There's no more subdivisions within that really. Um, other than there's one caveat that we'll talk about in just a minute. Um, but if it's a stereoisomer, that's a non-mirror image, um, then that's gonna give you our diastereomers that we talked about before, like where you flipped one of the stereocenters, but not the other. Um, and then, but then cis-trans are considered diastereomers as well. Um, I always just learned them as a sep as cis trans isomerism as a separate thing, but technically speaking, it is a non it's not a mirror image, um, and it's a but it's still got that stereo center where it's either this or that, um, where everything's still connected. So put cis cis trans diastereomers in the same spot, both the rings ring style and um, alkene style. All right, so the other thing that I think is kind of fun about our, our new textbook is the practice problems at the end of the chapter. Do almost all of them with the with the um, stick and ball model rather than just drawing it out for you, skeletal structure. So I thought this was um, a kind of a fun practice problem. So we're gonna assign R or S configurations to all of the chiral centers, all of the chiral carbons in these molecules. So we'll start with serine on the left. Um, and it might be helpful to start by, um, by drawing it out as a skeletal structure. Try and keep it this, the um, shape the same as much as possible as far as wedges and dashes. Um, but give that a try. And actually, so I have room to, to draw here. I'm going to jump out of the slideshow for a second and, uh, and crop this real quick so, we, so I can have just the serene. Uh, should be able to still see it while I'm doing that. So we're going to try and draw this as a skeletal structure. Start by drawing the carbons in. And really, in, before we start drawing it even, you might want to 
identify where your chiral centers are, just so you know where to focus when you're drawing everything out. So as I was drawing this, I, I started counting like, okay, well, this carbon has two hydrogens, they're identical. So that's not a chiral center. This carbon's got four different things attached to it. So that's a chiral center. This carbon's SP2, so that's not a chiral center. Both of these oxygens have two lone pairs, so that's identical, so they're not chiral centers. Nitrogen is the one case where we frequently will have a lone pair um, and have it be chiral as well, because a lone pair counts as something taking up space, right? But it's not the same as something else. And so when nitrogen's neutral, it doesn't have, uh, it has one lone pair. So you can, a lot of times you can have nitrogen be a chiral center. Um, so we do want to check that, that this nitrogen has two hydrogens. So it's really just the one in this case. And I just did my best to try and draw it more or less with everything in the same position. I kind of flattened out the two carbon carbon bonds by bringing this bottom piece forward yeah. a little bit. And then that kind of, you can kind of visually see it from this um, figure. If I bring this bottom one forward, that's going to kind of push this hydrogen to be on top of the nitrogen, right? It makes it makes it a little bit more clear which goes where there. So then, if we have if this is our structure, now we're going to try and assign priority to figure out if it's if it, um, if it's R or S. And again, in this case, finding the highest priority and lowest priority is easiest, right? Because we've got the nitrogen, nitrogen's higher atomic number than carbon. So right off the bat, we know that, that the nitrogen is our highest priority, and we know that the hydrogen is going to be our lowest priority. Going the other way, we get carbon, carbon, so that's a tie, and then oxygen, oxygen. So that's another time. And so we can see how it's going to be the same if we go that way. If we do, if we do it again, though. Carbon, and then we have to go a different route. So then we get a hydrogen versus carbon and another oxygen. So this would be our second priority. Down here would be three. It's usually going to wind up that, that if, if it's all the same atoms both directions, whichever one is more complicated tends to be the higher priority. We do have our tie breaking method, but usually you, you're instinct is going to start to pay off like okay it's all carbons and hydrogens and they're all, all roughly the same distance from the chiral center so the one that's more complicated looking is usually the one that, that you're going to go with this higher priority so identifying that as higher priority when you're just walking down the carbon chain mm -hmm. they're both carbon first step second mm -hmm. step is oxygen and then third step bottom one's hydrogen top one stays in oxygen so that's higher priority that's so this is so the first step's carbon, second step's oxygen, third step is a hydrogen for both of them. Right, for the, the second. Uh, for the first time through. Yeah, and then for the second one, you, if we're going to have to pick a different route, we can't go oxygen to the oxygen and then to something else because the only other thing on this oxygen is lone pairs, right? On the bottom oxygen. So if we're going to go for a different route, the only place we can take a different route would be go to one of the hydrogens for our second step. All right, so we have four sticking out towards us, and we would prefer to have four into the board. Not we would prefer, we need to to assign R and S properly. So if we can, but we can keep two steady. We keep two steady, and we're going to put four, my thumb, into the board. We're going to have to rotate everything this way, right? So one's where three is, three is where four is, four goes into the port. So showing that, you're going to get, here's our carbon, four is into the board, three is out of the board, one is here, and then two up and a little to the right. But it doesn't really matter that much as long as we keep its relative, its position relative to everything else the same. Mine looks a little bit different just because I flattened it out to fit it on, on the board there. Then we count one to two to three. 
which is going to give us an S. Right, so I can one, two, three, counterclockwise S. So R versus S is tricky for a couple reasons. One, there's a lot of places to mess up. You know, assigning priority. If you mess up assigning priority, you can do everything else right, you're gonna get the wrong answer. Right. And if you and if you just mix up doing the rotations, you could have done everything else right and still get the wrong answer. And so definitely something for on test. It's helpful to show your work so I can see where you went wrong. Um, because if and if you don't, and if you don't show your work and you get it wrong, I don't tend to give partial credit because this is essentially a true false question, right? It's a 50-50 guess, and I'm not going to reward somebody who just guesses for the same amount as somebody who shows their work had everything but one step wrong. Um, that gets partial credit versus just a guess is not going to get partial credit on this one. So worth showing your work at least a little bit, at least show me that you prior, you know, the priority. Um, you don't have to redraw it necessarily, but show me that you can assign the priority. And then then I can usually see what where you went wrong if you did. So would this be S serine or S serine? Yeah. And it turns out so so all amino acids have similar structure where you've got one carbon that's got a hydrogen, a nitrogen and a carboxylic acid group, and then something else attached. And this is the part that they would normally, in a biochem class, we would just call that the R group um, of the amino acid. And there, the priority winds up being the same for all of them too, because the R group for all of them is going to not be, is not going to take priority over either the, the amino or the carboxylic acid, because usually it's at least one carbon and then something else. And this, the, the um, acidic side chains that have the carboxylic acid on the side chain on the R group, um, they're two or three carbons away. So it's not as high priority. I think the one exception that I can think of that is, I guess there's two. Proline has a weird structure where, where the nitrogen is attached in a ring structure. And so it's still a, a high carbon, but it's a weird chiral carbon because it's part of a ring. Um, and then tryptophan has a big aromatic structure attached as the R group. I can't think of, I can't remember if that's, if it's got one plain sp3 carbon between them or not. Um, but either way, you wind up with all of these having similar stereochemistry. Um, and they all, I don't know if they, I don't know if I can say they're all S, but they all rotate light the same way. Um, which we we use a different a different set of letters for that. We use D and, and L. D is for dextra rotatory, meaning that it rotates plane, planar light to the right. And S, or sorry, L is lever rotatory, which means it rotates to the left. Um, but again, not tied to whether it's R versus S according to our naming system, because that's based on priority. Um, but it's, it's interesting, and um, like I, I just mentioned before, that was kind of like a random chance that led to our particular cells or life on Earth preferring the S stereoisomers over the R stereoisomers, because in all likelihood, when life was first beginning, um, there's probably relatively equal amounts of both of those stereoisomers present. And for whatever reason, again, probably one bug, um, our, the uh, proto cells, the green fully cells, um, that eventually would turn into all life on Earth, preferred one way over the other. Picked, they picked at random to get the S versions. Um, and some guy, you know, familiar with the Mass Effect video games? Yeah. Um, it, it was a, almost like a throwaway line in, in probably the second one 
um, but the scientists and me totally geeked out about it. They talked about some of the um, the uh, aliens talked about how they can't eat, eat the same food because they have their D amino acids versus the D proteins versus L proteins. <laughs> um, that's exactly what they're talking about. It would be life could arise very very similar to to the way it happened on Earth, but pick the opposite amino acids, right. and you wind up with with species where their their biochemistry was almost identical but totally incompatible at the same time. <laughs> yeah. They did a lot of those games. <laughs> they did, and they, they did a lot of, of interesting stuff. I, I enjoyed them for a lot of reasons. World building was really good, too. Yeah, much like Star Trek. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. All right, so this is adrenaline or epinephrine, same, same molecule, different name. Um, it depends a little bit. I think in in biochemistry in the U.S., they've switched to calling it mostly calling it epinephrine, um, but they still call it adrenaline in scientific papers and stuff like that in England. Um, it's the same molecule. If we're looking at it, are there where are there stereo centers? Remember anything sp two we can throw off because it's planar, right? Planar means we're not going to have, at, at most, we will have cis-trans isomerism. So none of these matter, but that carbon's got four different things attached. And here's an example too. The nitrogen's got four things attached, right? Got a hydrogen, it's got a, a lone pair, it's got a methyl group, and then it's got the rest of the molecule. So that nitrogen's a stereo center too. So if we're redrawing these, it's, it might be advantageous. If, let's just look at, at um, the carbon first. It might be helpful to just assign priority first before we draw everything else out. Um, because then we don't really need to draw the whole molecule. We can just do it in terms of um, of uh, priority substituents. So highest and lowest are easy again, right? Highest is the oxygen. Lowest, oops, lowest is the hydrogen. Then we get carbon, carbon, tie. Nitrogen or another carbon. Nitrogen, sorry. So now we don't need to redraw the whole molecule. This one was kind of helpful because it was easy to see the, the um, asymmetric centers. We didn't need to redo the whole thing in skeletal structure. So when you're redrawing these, the trick is just keep everything in the same spot as much as you can. So I'm going to call two and three our substituents that are in the plane of the board. Then we have one going away from us and one coming towards us, right? So in the same general directions. It's already set up for us. You get a one in four chance of that in the case, right? So one to two to three. That carbon is R. Do you go in pairs of What's how do we assign priority? The uh, protons. The number of protons. So it's got zero protons. That's so it's so it's four. So and it can be helpful. I'm going to draw the lone pair in there as going back and into the port for the sake. And then we're, when we redraw that, we'll be able to do that. So that's our lone pair is going to be four. We know that's going to be three. This is going to be two. There's one. So for the nitrogen, again, we're going to wind up with it already set up for us. Four, 
three, two, one. S. Hmm. Why don't you go about naming We wouldn't name this without you back. Fair enough. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, I mean, that you can, there is an IUPAC name for it. Um, but it's going to have a lot of parentheses. Our longest continuous, we would probably call this our longest continuous carbon chain. Because it's the longest continuous carbon chain that has the amine and has the has an alcohol on it. So then this would all get named with parentheses. We call it a one, two, three, four dihydroxyphenyl group. And then this is an amine that has a methyl attached to it. So we'd say it's an N methyl. When we have something attached to a nitrogen, instead of having it attached to a carbon, we don't just give it a number, we say it's N, as it's, that's why we still say just a number, we call it a locan. remember that word? It's because of stuff like this, so you can say N-methyl, N-methyl, you probably call that carbon one, that carbon two, two, you yeah. know, N-methyl, two hydroxyethanamine. And then throw that three, four dihydroxyphenyl in parentheses in front of that. So it, it works. And, as far as we have, and then we would say, and then we would have to say N, NS, comma, 2R. What is this? Yeah. So, but, so that's why adrenaline works well enough for us. Slide. All right. One last vocab term for, for stereochemistry before we get into talking about energy. Um, this is the last subclass of stereoisomers. And they're unique in that they're not stereoisomers. They have asymmetric centers. But anytime you have an internal mirror plane, inside the molecule itself. Then when you take a mirror image of the entire molecule, you don't get a non-superimposable mirror image. You get the same molecule back. And so that's that's what I was hinting at when we were looking like, I was like, oh, mirror image. Like, is there any that aren't enantiomers? Um, and this is one because if you have an internal mirror plane, where the molecule is identical in top and bottom. If, we, if you can picture drawing a mirror plane into the board and out of the, this molecule, you get the same molecule on top and bottom of that plane, right? It's identical. That means if you take the mirror image of that entire molecule, you get the same molecule back. So it's one that even though that's an asymmetric carbon and that's an asymmetric carbon, the fact that they're identical to each other and the rest of the molecule is identical on either side of this mirror plane means that when you take the mirror image of the whole molecule, you get the same thing. So this would be the mirror image of the molecule, right? Take this and flip it like a pancake and you get that back. Are two of those um, drawings to look exactly the same you say that they're asymptomatic? Yeah, and the, the, really the general idea. and the the easiest way to, to see it because there's a lot of different ways you can draw these polymers, right? Is if you can find a way to draw it where you can look at it and say the top half of the molecule is identical to the bottom half. Like literally, if you put a mirror here, you wouldn't even be able to tell it was there, right? Because it's the same on top and bottom. Versus over here. This is not a meso compound because this one, when you take the mirror image of it, you get this. But you can't make this one look like that one. If you tried to, by flipping it like a pancake, you're going to wind up with getting the same thing back again, right? 
we tried to spin it so that the OH was this, there's no way you can do it, right? You can't rotate it because it lacks that internal mirror plane. Yeah, it wouldn't be the same thing you put them here. Exactly. Exactly. So um, that's the trick with these meso compounds, is just one just recognizing that they're there. And if you know that term, it's not that hard to spot them. You just need to, it's one of those things that is easy to slip your mind with. Again, especially on a test, stressful situations, easy to forget, because usually you don't need to worry about that. Um, only shows up when you have two asymmetric centers and they're identical on both sides of the mirror. All right, so here's a molecule that has two asymmetric centers. How many stereoisomers are there? So we have two stereo centers. There's four ways we can draw it. But if one of them happens to be a meso compound, then two of the four are going to wind up being identical. So these ones are not meso, right? But if I drew them both up or both down, now we get that internal mirror plane. So if we flip both of these, these are the same molecule because it's meso compound. These ones are not the same molecule because they lack that internal mirror plane. Right, so usually two four, I guess I was trying to say. Oh, <laughs> right. Yeah, two more than this. <laughs> yes. So the other thing with the meso compounds that makes it a little bit tricky there, they're somewhat rare um, because everything has to be just so. So it's not just that there's two asymmetric centers and they're in identical positions to each other. Um, they also have to have the identical substituents because if I come back here. If one of these OHs, if I turn this into a methyl instead, now it's not a meso compound. Because now if I take this and flip it like a pancake, it doesn't look like this one. Because now I just switched where the OH and the carbon are, right? So when I say mirror, mirror plane, it, doesn't just apply to where the bonds are drawn, where the asymmetric centers are, it also applies to, they have to be the same substituents on there. And so um, it's, like I said, it's, it's relatively rare because everything, you have to meet all of those conditions for it to be a meso compound. This might be a question for a lot further down the line with different isotopes of like oxygen for that example change the meso compound. Yes, because you can tell the difference between them. Right. And in that case, that's the same number of protons though. So we would have to go to a tiebreaker tiebreaker 
<laughs> and call it and say, okay, well, we're going to arbitrarily say that that larger isotope of oxygen has priority over the smaller isotope of oxygen. But yeah, they do stuff like that where they, they do isotopic labeling and it does affect stereochemistry to some extent. Um, so I'd be curious to know, so different compounds have different um, amounts of optical activity, how much they rotate the light depends on what the compound is. Um, and so I'd be curious to know if something with it, with as subtle stereochemistry as just a different isotope, deuterium versus hydrogen, for instance, um, if that would be enough to cause, if, if you would see a lot less optical activity because it's barely stereoisomer, or if it's, or if that, it's a stereoisomer, therefore it has optical activity and how much of, how strong of a stereoisomer has no effect on the optical activity. That's something that I would, I might have to go look that up later today. Further down the line. <laughs> um, all right, so just a real quick one. Which of these are meso compounds? Again, drawing a ball and stick makes it trickier, huh? Go. It's B. Yeah. Yeah, B because we have, if we redrew it as a as a skeletal structure, that shows up pretty quickly, right? right? Pretty easy to see that mirror image. As well. A looks like it as well, right? We flatten that, that cyclo our cyclopentane out. We've got uh, mirror plane right through the middle, right? When you have all the bonds perfectly drawn and, and it's not, it doesn't look planar here, it's a little bit harder to see it, obviously, because, well, is that truly a mirror plane? Because nothing's really the same, both sides. But from a chemical standpoint, they're, everything's identical on both sides, right? They might not be totally flat relative to each other, but as far as where the bonds are drawn, it's the same on both sides. How about C? Yeah, if we went and tried to, if we redrew this at the way it is as a, skeletal structure, we get this, right? Um, I didn't copy and paste the part that says that the green is chlorine, but green is standard. Nitrogen is always blue, oxygen is always red, green is usually chlorine. Um, it doesn't really matter all matters if it's the same, right? Uh, other common, green shows up other places, but not commonly in OCHEM, usually as a metal. Um, the other common one, bromine and iodine, both like the color of those compounds. So bromine is like a reddish, reddish purple color. Usually an iodine is like a deep brown um, or purple the way it's usually drawn. So this one, if we tried to rearrange it, to spin it around to um, so that we could say, oh, well, it's got a mirror plane in it. We'd want to turn, put this, we want to rotate this carbon, carbon two right here, right? We rotated this to try and put the, the chlorines in the same direction and the carbons in the same direction. We're going to wind up with but I'm not going to answer that until it's going to go away in a second. So until we finish making our point here, um, now it doesn't have a mirror plane, right? So this is going to be a case of it's got two asymmetric centers. It's not a meso compound. It has a stereoisomer that is a meso compound. The diastereomer for this, if we flipped one of these stereo centers but not the other, would be a meso compound. But this one's not a meso compound. So when you flipped the uh, carbon 
does that make the carbon sort of come back out towards I guess, the yeah, I, I messed that up here. Or let me, let me get out of this and then get back in. So when I spun it around, yeah, I should put. That kind of threw me for a bit. So we really are rotating it 180 degrees, though. Mm -hmm. If we're trying to make, if we're going to call these all the carbon carbon bonds planar relative to each other, then I'm instead of just rotating it 120 degrees, I'm going to put the carbon all the way up 180 degrees so that everything, all the carbons, are flat. Right. And so if I'm doing it 180 degrees, that means that's going to put our chlorine not just where the carbon was, but a little bit into the board. And then the hydrogen is going to be sticking a little bit out of the board. You see it? it? That was a good question because when I looked at what I had run, I'm like, oh, I did do one of our standard 120 degree rotations. And I had to think for a second, why did I do it like that? But it's because I wanted to keep these four bonds or these three bonds planar. All right, we're going to do a couple of topics, a couple of review topics um, that are going to set up how we're going to talk about reactions and potential energy surfaces in more detail. Um, so enthalpy, we've talked about before, right? And kind of our shorthand for enthalpy or our, our shortcut for understanding enthalpy was the potential energy of a molecule that's stored in the bonds. So if you can think of potential energy, storing potential energy by like trapping a spring by, the, um, you know, think about a, a, um, a nerve blaster or something like that. I have a ton of those in my house because, because I always wanted them all when I was a kid. And now when I'm in the Goodwill, my son goes, can I have this? I have a hard time saying no. So those are all over my house right now. Um, if you think about like cocking one of those nerve blasters, you're basically pulling a spring and putting it on a latch. And you're storing potential energy that way, right? And that's, that's basically what enthalpy is. It's just that it's as a chemical bond between two atoms rather than, than a physical spring. Um, and so, but that is more, slightly more, accurate or specific way of thinking about it is, is the amount of energy that you get when you form a bond. So if you picture bringing two partially filled orbitals up to each other when they overlap, it gets lower in energy for everything, right? That amount of energy that it gets stabilized, by which it's stabilized, is the enthalpy. So if you put the same amount of energy back into that system, that's basically what you would do to pull the two atoms all the way apart again. And so, so this would be like an exothermic reaction? It'd be an endothermic reaction because you, so forming the bonds is exothermic. Yeah, forming the bonds. And, and putting energy into them to break them is endothermic. Which is why if you think about, um, basically, See if I can phrase that. I'm not going to say that yet. Um, but this is a little bit, this is actually a very, very specific way of thinking about it because it specifically is saying it's the energy required to break the bond homolytically. Homolytically means that you, you just undid this and so you wind up with one electron. When you break it homolytically, you get one electron going each direction. So basically undoing, forming the bonds. Turns out that's not generally how bonds break in organic chemistry um, because usually there's going to be one, one atom or one side of the bond has higher electronegativity than the other does. And so what, what usually happens is once you form these bonds, when you break them, they break heterolytically meaning that your pair of electrons stay together and you just, or you rip off one of the nuclei, basically. 
Um, the other way that we talk about talk about this in organic chemistry specifically is we call that same amount of energy, we call that the bond dissociation energy, but it's, a, it's just like the enthalpy of forming the bond in the first place. Um, but the nice thing about that is it does allow us to kind of estimate the total enthalpy for an entire molecule. If we, if we know that when hydrogen bonds to a hydrogen, it gives off 435 kilojoules per mole, or a carbon or hydrogen to a carbon is 435 kilojoules per mole. We can essentially just sum up all of the total bonds for the entire molecule and get an idea of how much energy is stored in the bonds for the entire molecule. And it also gives us an idea, a way that we can um, we can estimate delta H for a reaction by just looking at what bonds are breaking, what bonds are forming. Um, and it doesn't even matter that most of our reactions are actually going to happen heterolytically because energy is a state function, which um, is probably something that if it was said in gen chem, you probably don't remember it. But basically, it doesn't matter what path you take to get your, your delta H for reaction. It doesn't matter if we're going to estimate our delta H for the reaction by looking at all these bonds breaking homolytically, but they're actually breaking heterolytically, all that matters is where you start and end. So energy is a state function. We, I may have said this in this class. I've said it this quarter, but I think it might've been to the high schoolers. Um, but basically it's, it's a lot like altitude. Um, if your, your total change in altitude if you're driving from here to Carson City, it doesn't matter what route you take. Your overall, your net change in altitude is the same, regardless of if you go over Spooner or if you go over Mount Rose, right? And so it doesn't really matter that we're estimating the total energy change by looking at bonds breaking in a way that they don't actually break, as long as it's the same, we start and end in the same place. So they're going over the King's barriers and they're going to the of fire. So but it doesn't affect your net. Yeah, it doesn't matter because you end up in the same, same spot. spot, exactly. All right, and so that, that means that we can basically say, okay, well, I'm breaking three carbon hydrogen bonds, but I'm forming three carbon carbon bonds. And we can just sort of sum up those energies. I have to put in this much energy to break a bond, but then I get this much energy back out. And, but all of this to say is it doesn't really matter that these bonds are all homolytically broken to measure this in the first place, because we're going to reform them anyway, and it only matters where we start and end. Would there be any energy loss due to like stagnants in any of these bonds? What do you mean by that? Just like, like just to the surroundings? Just to the surroundings, yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah. So, so most everything is constantly transferring energy back and forth with the surroundings, right? Yeah. Um, we can try to limit that with things like uh, thermos. We can try and create what we call an adiabatic system, meaning that it doesn't transfer any energy to the system. So there's always some energy transfer to the surroundings. Um, but that's part of that is like, okay, well, if overall there's a negative delta H for this reaction. So overall, bonds are losing energy, therefore the surroundings have to gain that energy. And if you have a perfectly adiabatic system, the surroundings can be the rest of the molecules that are reacting, right? So the molecules themselves can start moving faster, can get hotter, if, if you're keeping all of that extra excess energy trapped in one space, the surroundings is just going to be all the rest of the molecules, even if they're also reacting. So like a sun. A sun, for instance. And that's, that is why, why you wind up with, like um, they call them um, uh, autocatalytic reactions, where the product of the reaction starts the reaction over again. And you wind up with these chain reactions or runaway reactions that just keep going indefinitely. Because if you need some energy to start the reaction, but the reaction itself produces energy, then it can give that energy, once it starts happening, it can give that energy to the next molecule. So it's a little bit like a candle burning, right? 
you need to start the candle burning, but once you start it burning, it continues burning on its own. Yeah. All right. This should look familiar to some extent, right? We've been using slightly different. Heat of a reaction, delta H for a reaction, is just gonna be the sum of all the bonds broken and formed. You form a bond, it gives off energy. It's negative energy because it's more stable to have a bond than not. If you break a bond, that's energy you have to put in, so that's a positive energy. The overall delta H for the reaction being positive or negative just tells you whether it's exothermic or endothermic. So you have to put energy in to break the bonds, but once they're broken, it's going to go back downhill as it forms new bonds, usually. And those the new bonds that you're making can either be more stable than what you started with, in which case it's going to be exothermic, or they can be less stable than what you started with, in which case it's endothermic. So for the exothermic <laughs> one, between the dotted line and the next one, is that our exit? So between the dotted line and the maximum? Yeah. With that difference there, your energy. That's going to be your energy of activation. Okay. So that's that's putting the flame to the candle wick to start it burning. You have to start the process, and then the reaction happens, continue, goes downhill in energy from there. Right? Or you can think about it. gravity is really a good way for thinking about these. If you just think of down as being more stable in terms of gravity, if you're trying to get something from, say, Lake Tahoe to Carson City, you have to put energy into it until you get to the top of Spooner, and then it can roll the rest of the way down without any extra energy being put into it, right? So the activation energy is getting to the pass, and then it's downhill from there. So delta H of the reaction doesn't depend on the pathway you take, but the activation energy does. And it takes, you have to put less energy in if you take Spooner versus if you take Kingsbury. Yeah. Because you have to put all that energy in to get it up there. But the net change doesn't depend on which path you take. Gotcha. I'm just trying to find the difference between bond dissociation energy and enthalpy as far so as enthalpy is the sum of all the bond dissociation energies okay so that's so the enthalpy is going to be your net change okay. and activation energy we and now i have to be careful because because activation energy does depend on which path you take we can't just say that the activation energy is the bond dissociation energies of all the bonds being broken because they're not being broken homolytically usually. And so because they could be taking these other shortcuts to not have to get all the way to the top of the pass or the highest pass, we can't make the same assumptions for the activation energy that we do for the delta H. Because delta H is always going to be the net change. In a simpler universe, then we, yes, we would be able to just say, oh, all the bonds that are being broken, that's the, the activation energy. That is an activation energy, but there's usually a, a lower activation energy. That, that activation energy is like, you're not taking a pass at all. You're just going in a straight line from here to Carson City and over the top of the mountain to get there. It is an activation energy. It's one way to get to Carson City, but it's not the easiest way. Right. Or if you had a plane, like a uh, catalyst. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, or if you can think of a catalyst as as um, um, drilling a tunnel through a mountain. Right, yeah. Instead of going up and over a pass, if you just go through drill the hole, then, then you don't have to get as high. Right, um, but you would need some sort of external forces to do that, and that's your catalyst usually. All right, so here's one way that we do this. We're gonna do this one, and then we'll take our break.
predict the sign and the magnitude. So is it going to be exothermic or endothermic? And we can use these to predict roughly what delta H is going to be for the entire reaction. So all we need to do is you need to sum up all the bonds that we're breaking and all the bonds that we're forming. And we just need to keep track of, okay, the bonds that are breaking, that energy I'm putting into it. So those are positive numbers. Bonds that I'm forming, that's the energy I'm gonna get out of it. So those are negative numbers. So it's the bonds broken minus the bonds formed. If they're all written as positive numbers, which they usually are. Bonds broken is going to be are going to be positive numbers because you have to put the energy in. I have to work my way through the logic every time because I don't memorize that formula. Yeah. Um, yeah, so bonds broken and then all the bonds formed are going to be favorable. So that's all they're all going to be negative. So bonds broken minus bonds formed. And anything that's not changing, we can just ignore. It. You could take the entire molecule apart on both sides, but it's going to be a wash, right? Because there's no change to it. We could break all of the carbon hydrogen bonds, some of all of the carbon hydrogen bonds on this side, but if we're just going to reform them on this side, what's the point? So, really, we're looking at what's changing and we're ignoring the parts of the molecule that are staying the same. So we're going to get 381 and 243 for, we want six, six, four, or 624. Are being broken. And then on this side, 331 and 431, so 762. Okay. Ready? So delta H for the reaction. So exactly. So what is that? Mine's up to be in 80. 78, negative 78 kilojoules per mole difference. If I did my math right, if I didn't know where the error is, right? It's just a arithmetic error. So if it's negative, then we're going downhill in energy on our potential energy surface. Downhill in energy by 78 kilojoules per mole Means it's exothermic, exactly. It's going to release that heat. Well, it's kind of a, it's kind of a, a handy way to be able if you have a giant table of these bond association energies, or if you're just looking for real generally, um, it's a good way to estimate whether reaction is going to be downhill in energy, um, and by roughly how much. And, and if I go back. This one, you can see that there's, you know, a carbon, carbon hydrogen bond. Not all carbon hydrogen bonds are the same, but they're all close to the same. They're close-ish. So as far as like just general ideas, like oh, 
I'm breaking a carbon hydrogen bond and I'm forming these bonds, you can get a good idea, even if it's not perfect. Um, figure out if it's going to be downhill in energy or not. And the more comprehensive of a table you have of this, the more specific, the more accurate your numbers can be. Um, which is kind of handy to be able to predict things ahead of time, whether it's going to be exothermic or endothermic. And it's still a smaller table than all those delta H of formation values um, that we had in Gen Chem, right? And those didn't even get into organic compounds, right? So you can imagine if you tried to do a delta H of formation values for OCHEM, and you'd have to list literally every single molecule that we could potentially make and have a delta H of formation for it. You could do it, but that's like a textbook itself. Um, <laughs> just on the table. <laughs> Right. So this is this is sort of a lot more condensed way of doing the same thing. Do um, enthalpy and electronegativity are they independent or dependent on each other? As far as like if I plug in the algorithm to get out an enthalpy given electronegativity, if you, the you could probably look at your difference in electronegativity to estimate bond dissociation energy. Because it looks like the electronegativity, like where we mark polar versus non-polar, like, you know, like 24 or something, is the difference yeah. between, and we're 435 and 410. So I don't know, it's just- it's Oh, so as far, not as far as the actual numbers. There's no connect, like, that was a 0.4 difference in electronegativity is where we drew the line. And that was about the same difference as a carbon to a hydrogen bond, but that's, I think that's coincidence here. Okay, gotcha. Um, there's probably, you could, if you plotted the difference in electronegativity between two atoms and the bond association energy, mm -hmm. there might be some connection there. It was a hydrogen to a hydrogen though. Maybe they're not, but not not dependent. Like it, it's not going to be a strong connection because a hydrogen to a hydrogen bond is four hundred and thirty-five, right? And that's zero difference in electronegativity. And a car and a chlorine to a chlorine bond was two forty-three, and that's zero difference in electronegativity. But chlorine is so uh, there might be something there, but not that I've ever seen a mathematical relationship for. But there might be some conceptual connections. All right. Let's take a break. Let's come back at 10 after. Um, and then we'll do a little bit of review on delta G in spontaneity. Um, but that's these next next five or six slides are gonna be all of you from Gen Chem. And then we'll put it all together. Let's talk about all this the other day, helping some. I was just taking their midterms, so they were just going over an entropy and different yeah. kinds of reactions and stuff. So I drew all those graphs for them. And nice. Did all yeah. that, but I didn't want to speak too much because I wasn't sure exactly what's going on. <laughs> right. And and you don't want to confuse like for a bio class, they might not need it in as much depth as, as you would want to talk about it necessarily. You do have to exactly. be careful with that, right? <laughs> So I started talking about spontaneity and they hadn't even heard of it. I'm like, it's not what you think it means. <laughs> yeah, exactly.
Fair weather watch. Right after it snowed. <laughs> Finish that lab in the way yet? No. <laughs> I don't have internet in my house right now, so I think that's um, like it's like it's been like a week since I've been going. <laughs> what about here? Do you not? I just haven't had any time to hang out yeah. here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah, he's all right. Okay. <laughs> I feel like everyone I ask you like another pieces. <laughs> I went up to Genoa Peak yesterday and it was snowing pretty good up there. Yeah, I have done it. I'm surprised it was snowing. I didn't think it was gonna snow that much. I mean it didn't stick, but I don't know down here. I'm surprised it was. Yeah, me too. I thought it was just gonna be me and Sean today. It's easy to gauge who doesn't understand what it is. It's just <laughs> one person here. <laughs> I just become more like office hour, right? Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I've ever given a lecture to just one person, but I did have, this is not even my smallest class I've ever had here. <laughs> there was one year that we had, we offered our intro to biochem class, which you might have taken that. I don't know. Okay. I don't think so. I think I just did the bio series. Okay. Um, there was, for whatever reason, there was a year that, that we had, we had two students that needed to take intro to biochem as so it could transfer as like a, a chemistry um, chemistry level nutrition class basically they were going into dietetics or something like that and almost never does anybody even take that class and so we had we had three people take the class two that needed it and one I think it was Cody took it for fun um, back back before he had taken Gen Chem um, <laughs> Yeah, we had three people in that class, and only two of them show up, showed up on a regular basis. <laughs> I don't think I ever, we ever did a zero or a one person class. I don't think I ever had zero, though. Yeah. I never had a day where everybody didn't show up. That was, that was, that was pre COVID, though. So no, I wasn't recording lectures or anything like that. So um, that, that, was, that was a weird class that way. I, I didn't like that class, but I'm not very good at the bio side of things. What would you do if nobody showed up? Just be and recording your own lecture. <laughs> I still had to cross that bridge when we got there, but um, no, I I don't know. I mean, traditionally, what I would do is just not have class, and we'd be a lecture behind, um, or I would just not give the lecture, but you're still responsible for learning it. Like here's the slides, here's the chapter in the book. You didn't show up for lecture, so good <laughs> luck. I'll give this way. <laughs> I've never, I've never recorded a lecture asynchronously. I've never recorded a lecture without a live audience in some form. Even during COVID, it was always on Zoom, right? Um, so I've, I, it's a different thing to not have people listening at the same time because it's like, do I stop? Do I edit it? Do I just go for it? Or it? <laughs> anyway, um, just to go back to our our Gen Chem definition of spontaneous, um, spontaneous processes are those that can proceed without any outside intervention. Um, but that doesn't always mean that you don't need activation energy. Every reaction is going to have activation energy. And so you can wind up with something that's a spontaneous process, meaning delta G is negative, if reaction will happen, but it won't happen at a measurable rate at the current temperature. 
but it's not like things just happen on their own. So spontaneous combustion is a, is a good example of this, right? It's a, that's not spontaneous, is not being used the same way it would be in science. Right. Spontaneous, and that's that causes some some mix-ups with people that think spontaneous combustion is a, is a phenomenon because you can look at it and say, oh, if you take all of the molecules in the human body and burn them, that's a hugely exothermic process and way downhill in energy in terms of delta G. So it's spontaneous. It's spontaneous in the chemistry definition of spontaneous, not in the sense that it will just randomly happen. Um, some of them, though, at room temperature will happen on their own without any outside interventions. So for example, a nail rusting is spontaneous. A rusty nail becoming a fresh nail is non-spontaneous. You can change the conditions that cause that to happen. Um, you can take the rusty nail and put it through electrolysis to force it to go back the other way, but not without changing the conditions significantly. Once you change the conditions enough by, say, hooking it up to a battery or putting it into an electrolytic bath, then it's spontaneous the other direction, but only because you changed the conditions. All right. I just, I like the second law of thermodynamics because I think it's, it's very misunderstood and also very, very powerful to think about. Second law of thermodynamics is one that says, for any, so for reversible processes, the entropy for the universe, the change in entropy for the universe is equal to the change in entropy for the system plus the change in entropy for the surroundings and is equal to zero if it's reversible. Almost no processes are actually reversible by the chemistry definition of reversible. The chemistry definition for, of reversible basically means you're at equilibrium. When you're at equilibrium, it's a reversible process because it's happening equally both directions. Almost anything that's not at equilibrium is going to go through an irreversible process, which means the entropy of the universe has to be greater than zero. The change in entropy of the universe has to be greater than zero. So for all spontaneous processes, the entropy of the universe increases. Which is, you know, anytime we can make a blanket statement about the entire universe, that's kind of a big deal, right? Usually there's some caveat. Well, this is true on Earth, or this is true for this system, or this is usually true. But this is not a usually true. This is an always true. This is a fundamental law of the universe. If something happens, it's because it's the overall entropy of the universe is increasing as it happens. A quick recap as to what, what is entropy though? Chaos. Chaos. <laughs> the system extent actually. Um, that's disorder is maybe a better way of thinking about it, but the, the mathematical definition of entropy is just how many possible arrangements are there of all the pieces. Um, and so things that are more disordered tend to have more possible ways that you can ar arrange the pieces because there's just more pieces. Um, the more you have one distinct molecule instead of having 10 atoms, that's less entropy because the 10 atoms can be arranged in a lot of different arrangements, a lot of different um, configurations. Whereas if you don't have one molecule, it's basically got a tenth the possible ways to arrange it, if that. Um, so, but what the way that people, this gets misused all the time is people, it gets, it gets used as an argument that um, there must have been some outside force causing things like planets to form or causing things like life to develop because that's making a less random system. Life is less random than just having all the atoms flying around on their own, right? But what that's neglecting is that's 
is that Earth or any planet is not a closed system. We think of it as a closed system because we don't think of molecules leaving Earth, but there's constantly, there's light being dumped into Earth, which means energy is being dumped into Earth. And energy being dumped into Earth means that you can locally have decreases in entropy that still increase the overall entropy for the universe because we have a sun. Life, organized life is not going to develop in a solar system or planet without a sun because you need to be dumping energy into it to get these second law thermodynamics to be, it's not being broken, but for it to, to um, not apply, right? So we, the universe is a closed system, at least we treat it like it is um, to the best of our knowledge. And you could, that might be a better question for Bruce. Um, but I believe that we can make the assumptions that the universe is a closed system. So infinitely closed versus <laughs> that, That's right, exactly. exactly. Um, so we'll see, maybe we won't, but uh, that's where my expertise falls apart is the boundary conditions of the universe. Um, so Boltzmann was the one who first came up with this. Um, I just I just love the fact that he, um, this is the picture of him that was chosen, the bust that they chose to make him. He, he just must not have been very well liked. Um, when he died, this is what they put on his tomb. Um, and he was the one who developed Boltzmann constants but the idea of entropy is, is he defined it as entropy is a constant times natural log. And this is in Europe. And in Europe, they use log um, without specifying what the base is, means natural log. Um, so natural log of W times a constant. W is all the possible configurations. So it's it's a log based scale and KB is tiny, tiny, tiny as well. So, but you can imagine if you have a mole of gas atoms in in an enough space that you could have 10 moles of gas atoms because gases have a lot of empty space, right? How many different ways could you arrange those? It's a huge number, right? Think about how big a mole is and then think about things like, okay, well, if I put one atom right here, that atom, and then I put, then I have 10 moles minus one spaces to put the next atom. Mm -hmm. And all of those possibilities, it's a huge number for W. And we can do this with tiny little, they call them microstates. We can do this, these simulations, to develop this math with something that's, you know, 100 by 100 and with 10 molecules in it. Um, so would that be something similar to like shuffling a deck? Yeah. Cards? Like, exactly. Yeah, there's some like trillion really ways to do it differently. Exactly. That's just 52 cards. Yeah, that's 52. It's, it, it, and now think about think about doing the same thing, except instead of just shuffling the cards and just you have when you shuffle the cards, you basically put them all in the same spot, right? Mm -hmm. Think about turning all the cards face down and arranging them in something the size of this entire room. If you made a grid on the floor of this entire room. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of empty space, right? Because there's only 52 cards, where there'd be, I don't know, 10,000 spaces in this room. All of that empty space also means increased entropy because putting it here versus there, even if it's the ace of spades in both cases, it's not the same state. So it adds up quickly. It adds up really quickly. Um, <clears throat> um, the other so there, there is some amount of entropy within the molecules as well. Um, this gets back to the way we were talking about how different types of rotations and steric forces um, and interactions are going to cause different types of are going to have different energies where they will with they will, where they will absorb energy. Um, all the different types of of movements that you can have are going to have some slightly different energies associated with them, right? So there's a vibrational mode where both of the hydrogens attached to an oxygen and water molecule are both moving away from the oxygen at the same time. 
But then there's also a vibration mode that's slightly different where one of them is moving away and one of them is moving in at the same time. There's a, and then there's the vibration where the hydrogen is moving closer and further from each other at the same time. All of these different vibrational modes are going to have different energies associated with them. But there is some uncertainty, some randomness, some entropy associated with these. The more possible vibrations you have, the more entropy the molecule has in itself. It has less entropy in that the hydrogens have to stay close to the oxygen. But there is some amount of movement happening. And anytime you have movement happening, there's entropy. Um, typically, I'm, I believe for non diatomic molecules, there's three N minus five vibration modes, where N is the number of um, atoms in the system. So for water, three n times minus five, three times that's fifteen vibrational modes. Water, right? Three times, or sorry, nine minus five, so four vibrational modes. There's these ones, and then there's one that's not being shown here. Maybe for water, it's got the internal mirror plane. Maybe it's three n minus six for water. There's I can't remember exactly what the derivation is. Um, but you can see how, think about our, our um, cyclohexane with two methyl groups on it, going back to like how complicated it gets, how quickly. That's going to be C8H16. Right? I think. Either way, it's something close to that. That's a total of 24 atoms. Three times 24 minus five is going to give us a huge number of vibrations, right? So we're not going to be able to, to differentiate between is it this torsional strain or that torsional strain very, very quickly. And that's why that fingerprint region gets so complicated looking so quickly as well. All right, so quick derivation. So based on the, um, the second law of thermodynamics, if we just redefine some things and do some algebra or some, yeah, some algebra, um, we can have a way of de deciding whether something is spontaneous or not. And that's, this is where delta G comes from, right? So if you start from delta S of the universe is equal to delta S of the system plus delta S of the surroundings, we can say that delta S of the surroundings is equal to Q of the system divided by T. Because any change in, in energy for the surroundings had to come from the system. We're just arbitrarily saying the system is whatever reaction we're looking at. So the surroundings is literally the rest of the universe. So if you, and if you're at a constant pressure, then the Q for the system is delta H for the system. And the key here is that if we do this, we do some substitutions, we can wind up with this. Delta S for the universe is equal to delta S for the system plus negative delta H for the system over T. Right. And since nobody likes fractions, to multiply everything by negative t, and we get negative t times delta s of the universe is equal to delta h for the system minus temperature times delta s for the system. So this is really, really useful because this is the term that determines whether or not a reaction is spontaneous, right? As long as delta s of the universe is positive, the reaction is spontaneous. And we've redefined that so that everything is just in terms of the system. The surroundings don't matter because the system is what dictates what happens to the surroundings. Right? And so that's actually where the definition of delta G, remember, it gives free energy. 
is negative t times delta s to the universe. They just said, okay, we're going to call delta g is negative t times delta s of the universe. So as long as the delta g is equal to negative t delta s universe. So as long as this number is positive and t is in Kelvin, so t is always positive, then there's that negative sign, right? So if, if delta S for the universe is positive, delta G will be negative. So this is, this is where we get our, our ability to, to mathematically determine whether a reaction will happen or not, whether it's spontaneous or not, is based on delta S of the universe. Pretty clever the way they, they sort of redefined things and just did some substitution. It's not even that tricky in math, really, right? Um, the trickiest part is actually Identify. is identifying and saying that this, this relationship is probably the trickiest part. Once you have that, now surroundings is gone from your equation. And then to demonstrate that a little bit more to get the k equals negative delta k over t. No, so that's Boltzmann. If that is actually um, Boltzmann's law, if you think about the s is equal to is it kb Boltzmann's constant times natural log of w. Mm -hmm. I see it. There's an E in there, right? And that's why KD shows up in that expression as well. When you turn this into a change, then you get final minus initial and you can combine some terms differently. Um, but it, it's basically Boltzmann's constant and Boltzmann's function, Boltzmann's distribution is that, that um, equation effectively um, is basically a modified bell curve. I, it's a it's similar to a Gaussian distribution, but for a Gaussian, so it's usually done as so the number of particles or number of atoms, um, and then this is the energy that they have, and it's going to be a function of the temperature. But basically, you wind up with something that looks like this. It's kind of bell curve shaped, except it's skewed way right because you can never have any molecules that are actually at zero energy, right? And even if they were, they couldn't be less than zero energy. And so you wind up with, with basically this function is given by that e to the negative energy over RT. If you change T, the shape of this changes a little bit. And R, R is actually, if you take Boltzmann's constant, you multiply by Avogadro's number, you get R. So this is in terms of energy, in terms of joules per mole. If you did it per atom, you would use KB instead of R. So R and KB are really the same number. Um, so this, and then what happens when you, if you change the temperature, if you raise the temperature, when you look at this function, so the bottom of this gets, or this exponent gets smaller, right? And so then you get e to a less negative number, which is gonna flatten things out. You wind up with it being more flat and more skewed. And what happens is, is we can say that a reaction will happen, um, basically, the, and we say that the activation energy for reaction is right here. The integral of, all the, of everything above that in energy are the fraction of the molecules that have enough energy to make it over the barrier. Mm -hmm. That's the K. And that's the K. And so you can see how by increasing the temperature, we get a much larger fraction of the molecules can, uh, can overcome that activation barrier. So Boltzmann was 
absolutely brilliant. He founded the entire field of statistical thermodynamics, which is why he gets a constant and equation, and he's got a whole distri Boltzmann distribution named after him. He basically figured out how stats work in the real universe, as opposed to just in the abstract math way. He said, well, Gaussian distributions are great, but this is how things actually work. Was he around before this time, or was he involved in the discovery of I believe E was known before that, because at least the golden ratio was known before that. The golden ratio is tied to E, I believe. Um, I'd have to double check that, though. That'd be a good question. Though. He was like, he was like uh, mid to late 1800s. Okay. Um, I should make light of his uh, his bust um, or anything like that because he was a profoundly sad person. He committed suicide despite having you know being like the foremost mind in the world on this stuff. And then his good friend and his um, student, who went on to carry on his work, went on to commit suicide as well. Um, so it's a very contagious field. And, and, I mean, that's that. <laughs> um, I have to look for the uh, there's a quote that from from like the um stat neck um textbook that gets used it basically says, like, um, so and now it's our turn to study statistical mechanics. Perhaps we should approach this with caution, <laughs> um, but it's uh, yeah, the guy was brilliant though, and it's like on. I would put him on the same level as Newton, as far as like he invented the field. They, not to minimize the contributions of other people, but still. Yeah. All right, so let's talk about how this actually matters to us. We talked about enthalpy of these reactions being relatively straightforward to think about, I mean, relatively. Or are we just sort of looking at, are we making bonds that are more stable than what we started with, right? Um, and so if delta H is negative, that's exothermic, and that's favorable in terms of the reaction being spontaneous. If we say, okay, it depends if we can't really get around using like subjective language to some extent, um, but let's, if we're going to say delta spontaneous is favorable for the reaction that favors spontaneity, delta H being negative, favors the reaction being spontaneous. Would you say favors the products? Favors the products, yeah. If delta S is positive, if you increase entropy of the system, this is all from the point of view of the system now, right? If you increase the entropy of the system, that's also favorable in terms of favors making the products, favors being spontaneous. So if both of these are true, Spontaneous, right? Because it doesn't matter what temperature you're at. If delta S is positive and delta H is negative, delta G will always be negative, right? But you could have some cases where, where the temperature matters, right? If delta H favors being spontaneous, but delta S doesn't, then changing the temperature is going to determine whether the reaction is spontaneous or not. Right? Because as this temperature gets bigger, this term gets bigger. It's interesting. Temperature changes the magnitude of entropy? Not quite. Um, entropy is defined as temperature. To, so the, the temperature of the system affects the entropy of the system because you're affecting how, how many possible states things can be in. At a low temperature, there are few, fewer possibilities and things are not moving as quickly. So you're not kind of cycling between states as, as rapidly. So entropy has a temperature component to it, which is one of the reasons why the units, okay, the units for Boltzmann's constant, I'm gonna say it's, I might be mixing this up with something else, but I think it's 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34, but it's joules times seconds. 
Or sorry, joules times Kelvin. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's sort of energy times the temperature. Right. Yeah. Um, it doesn't really make any sense unless you think about it in terms of what the temperature is affecting how many different states you can actually get to in a second. Um, so, but then we took that term and we multiplied everything by T so that we didn't have the fraction. And so it wound up being tied to this term in, in our definition of delta G. But really the temperature is, is, is delta H over temperature was entropy of the surroundings, but that's just harder to visualize and think about. So in terms of this equation though, when your temperature goes up, your entropy gets more important. When temperature goes down, delta H becomes more important. Delta H is not changing with temperature, but it, as temperature drops, this term gets smaller. It also means there's some crossover point where it becomes spontaneous, where at a lower temperature, it might be non-spontaneous, and then you get to a certain temperature, and then above that temperature, it is spontaneous. Right, so basically, we, we kind of have a, a Punnett square of options here, where we, we can have favorable and favorable, in which case delta G is always negative, always spontaneous. We can have favorable, unfavorable. We can have unfavorable, favorable. And we can have unfavorable, unfavorable. Well, and unfavorable, unfavorable means a positive delta G no matter what temperature you're at, right? Because there is, if they're both unfavorable, it doesn't matter what temperature you get to, you're always going to have a positive delta G. And if delta S is favorable, the delta H is not, it's going to be spontaneous at high temperatures. If delta H is favorable, but delta S is not, then it's going to be spontaneous at low temperatures. Because this, if, this term being favorable or unfavorable is the one that's going to determine whether temperature, increasing the temperature makes it more spontaneous. All right. Although at this point, We've still only been talk talking about it under standard conditions, meaning all of our concentrations are, um, we're going to say they're the same. Usually it's, it's defined as we're going to say the concentration of everything is one molar. And at those conditions, that's what we're actually predicting when we looked up those delta H values and delta S values in the back of the book in Gen Chem. But really, as your concentrations change, as the reaction starts happening, your delta G value starts changing. And, but that actually winds up being, here's where you get your definition of the equilibrium constant and that K term, because there becomes some point, you start at high delta, a very negative delta G. You can also think of delta G as being um, the slope. If we had G as the Y value, delta G is the slope. Gotcha. So you can say, okay, well, everything is going to go downhill until you get to some minimum value of energy, a lowest energy you can get to for that system, at which point it's going to sit there. It doesn't have a delta G force one way or the other, which is what we call equilibrium. Delta G equals zero at equilibrium. If delta G equals zero at equilibrium, that's going to give us our ability to, to define K as being these concentrations and tie them then also to E to the minus delta G of reaction under standard conditions over RT. So you could possibly get that equation using Q values, right? It doesn't need to be at equilibrium. Is that yes? Yeah, so the Q values are going to be give us a way of, of if Q gives us a number that's greater than equilibrium, then K and Q, 
um, then that means you've got too much product, right? Right. Which means you're over here. Right. And the reaction is going to happen back this way. Everything's always trying to get to delta to delta G equals zero at equilibrium. And we can do some, we can do some um some stuff with Q in defining Q and turning that into the delta G value for that particular mixture. Like you, if you wanted, if you were starting right there in terms of concentrations, you can wind up with plugging Q in instead of KEQ and get actual forces and things like that. Um, so you're making the right connections there. The Q is for the most part, it's just a way of, of simplifying this so that we don't need to actually get delta g for the current system we can just say well i don't know what delta g for the current system is but i know that it's going to move this way yeah my understanding beforehand was that k and q or you couldn't apply q to that delta g but yes you can well you, so you you do have to be careful because this term relies on at equilibrium meaning Mm -hmm. This is how that delta G for the current system has to be zero for that to matter. Right. And so you do have to be careful with your definitions. You can tie them together, but you get you don't want to be able to set one side equal to zero then. Right. And if you can't set one side equal to zero, then you need to plug in all of your values. And it gets way more complicated very quickly to do any algebra with it. This is just nice and easy. Yes, exactly. We like it when when delta G is equal to zero, because that makes things a lot simpler. Here's the other form of that equation, right? Delta G is equal to negative RT natural log of KEQ. Um, and that's gonna give you, again, that's delta G naught, that's delta G at standard conditions. And that's why you can't just plug in any, but you can't plug in Q or K in this kit using it this way as that's simple you that will give you delta g not in standard conditions at whatever your current conditions are would that just be like in terms of one point on that graph basically yeah you would get that would give you a way to estimate and again maybe i'm making some assumptions that aren't that aren't valid so don't actually try to do any of this math necessarily but, um, yeah. but in theory in theory what you'd be estimating is the slope of that function at those particular conditions okay maybe <laughs> but again not. just as likely not yeah <laughs> um we can if you're interested about it come to office hours and um, and we can pull out one of my old PCAM textbooks where they actually go through these definitions more rigorously. Um, and we can see if that holds up. I uh, conceptually it holds up, yeah. but I don't know if mathematically it does. All right. So here's how I can ask questions about this. What I actually expect you to be able to take away from this, all this high level, very conceptual stuff, abstract stuff is Determine whether the reaction favors reactants or products. If you know delta G, you know whether K is greater than zero or less than zero, or great, sorry, greater than one or less than one. K is always going to be greater than zero, right? So you can't take log of zero. Um, so if you wind up with delta G for a system that is plus 1.52 kilojoules per mole, you don't even have to do any math to answer that question, right? You just need the sign in front of it. So this part's red herring. That's all that matters. Delta G is positive. It's non-spontaneous. And non-spontaneous doesn't mean it won't happen. It means that equilibrium favors the reactants. When we we got off track of talking about that graph. Let me go back for a second. But every reaction has a finite possibility of occurring at every temperature. But the net movement of the entire system, the point where delta G equals zero for that system, is what's going to determine whether or not we call it spontaneous or not. 
and we call it spontaneous when we're favoring the products over the reactants, when K is greater than one. So that's all we're really looking for. If we want to know, it, is it spontaneous? Doesn't mean it can't happen the other way. It just means that under standard conditions, we favor where we'll have more products than reactants in equilibrium. If K is equal to 0.5, what's the first rule of equilibrium? Products of reactants. So at its most basic, qualitatively, without putting any numbers, if K is less than one, the bottom of this fraction is bigger than the top half, right? So it's favoring the reactants. So K equals one is when delta G equals zero. And that's the crossover point between favoring reactants or products or spontaneous and non-spontaneous. Those are all different ways of saying the same thing. So I always come back to this definition of K you have a number value for K, it doesn't matter. It just matters if it's just like delta G only matters if it's positive or negative. K only matters qualitatively. Is it greater than one or less than one? If we want to actually do any math with it, obviously the numbers matter and the exact reaction matters and things like that. But more broadly, qualitatively, we just think of it like this. Reactions carried out at 298 Kelvin, for which delta H is plus 33 kilojoules per mole, and delta S is plus 150 joules per mole Kelvin. Unfavorable. We actually need to put in the numbers in this case and do the math because it will be delta S is favorable um, for the reaction to happen, but are we at a high enough temperature to overcome the 33 kilo equals mole unfavorable? That's joules per mole and kilojoules per season. Right. So so 33 times 10 to the 3 minus 298 and was 150. Leave it off the units for in the interest of space. 300 times 150, is that going to get us more than 33 kilojoules per mole? What do we get? This is 44. 44,073. So we are going to get. Um, yeah, we're going to get a negative number, negative, what is that, 12. Yeah. And again, all that matters is that it's negative. If it's negative, it's spontaneous, which means it favors products. It's, it's, I know. <laughs> They still matter, but I didn't leave myself space for them. Um, especially when it came to the kilojoules versus joules. I've done this enough times that I know that that always disconnect. They always report delta S values in joules per mole Kelvin, and they always report delta H in kilojoules. So it's just one to pay attention to. So if it's exothermic, That means you've got a negative delta H, right? So favorable or favors products. And a positive value for delta S system. Also favors the products, right? Mm -hmm. So in this case, Exactly. So we get this is a case where it would be spontaneous at all temperatures. 
is no matter what, we're going to get a negative value for delta G. We can make it more negative by changing the temperature, by doing this at high temperatures. But either way, we don't even need the numbers in this case. We can just say it's definitely going to favor the products because both the enthalpy and the entrop entropy both favor the reaction being spontaneous. Should we have a negative temperature? Right. No. Because it's in Kelvin. Because we're in Kelvin. Think back to the Boltzmann distribution, right? Part of what made it different than a Gaussian distribution is that we were able to say nothing can go lower energy than this. So we were dealing with absolute zero at that point. So all of our temperatures when we're dealing with delta G's and delta and um, this any of these variables were always in one in Kelvin. If it's an endothermic reaction with a negative value for delta S, Reactants are going to be favors. Favored because a negative delta S and a positive value here means that delta G will be positive no matter what. Delta G is positive. Again, doesn't mean the reaction can't happen. It just means at equilibrium, you're favoring the reactants. The reaction is happening less than the reverse reaction. <clears throat> this is all still based on perspective. Like, we want to look at the other way and be positive and negative. They're just flipped. Exactly. So for D, exothermic reaction, the positive value for delta S is we could, it could be the reverse reaction for E. Yeah. If it's always non-spontaneous in one direction, by definition, that means it's always spontaneous the other direction. And again, it doesn't mean that it won't happen. It just means that when you hit equilibrium, you're going to favor one side or the other. And perfect timing today. That never happens. Good word. All right, and so one more. So next Thursday is the midterm. Um, we'll do like another half lecture ish on Tuesday, and then review the rest of lecture and on in our lab period next week. Um, and it's basically going to be using some of these same ideas, but now instead of just talking about it at equilibrium, we'll bring in activation energy and talk about kinetics, which is rates.